Next question uh, from Lindsay Forbes, who asks, could the red shift uh, from a quasar be gravitational as the light escapes from the quasar? And is it possible to calculate the mass of the quasar from the additional redshift? That, that's, that's a really good question. And I've just finished uh, teaching my 30 lectures in general relativity and cosmology. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so one of the things that we look at there is this question of the redshifting of material in the vicinity of black holes, mm -hmm. right? So, so it's one thing that we, 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 we know how to calculate. What we have with cosmological redshift uh, is that the redshift that you get from a quasar as a photon has to climb away from that quasar just doesn't get big enough unless mm. the matter is uh, the emission is coming from really really close to the black hole so what we've got is that the um the the redshift that we we see um is is just not the same sort of scale as we see when we look at quasars out in the universe. What we find is that you know there's there's a big redshift due to the cosmological part, and there's a, a different kind of redshift in terms of um, the scale that we see with regards to the stuff that's swirling around because it's not that close to the actual black hole itself. Mm -hmm. Now there's there's a couple of things that we we can uh, talk about here. Firstly, that so if if the redshift was due to the gravitational effect of the black hole, mm -hmm. then what we would sort of expect to see is that maybe all quasars should have about the same kind of redshift. Yes. Right? Uh, but what we find, of course, is that quasars, which are generally fainter on the sky, have a larger redshift, mm -hmm. which we interpret as that they are further away, right? So in terms of the cosmological expansion, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, so the, that, the, the naive picture that it's coming from in the vicinity of the black hole is, is to explain the cosmological redshift just doesn't seem to work. But that doesn't mean that we can't use the redshift of materials swirling in the vicinity of black holes because, again, it's something that we can calculate. So what we have to remember is that we have our black hole, we have a disk of material which is swirling around at very high speeds, a large mm -hmm. fraction of the speed of light. This material is very, very hot, but it's mm -hmm. still atomic material. So one of the uh, atoms that's in that material is iron. Mm -hmm. And iron, um, in that environment, you can strip off lots of electrons, uh, but you can still see transitions, right? Electrons are still bouncing around. And so we're getting emission from um, electrons jumping about in iron atoms swirling around in the accretion disk. Now, when we look at the emission that we see, now, if you imagine that if I've got a whole bunch of iron atoms in a box, mm -hmm. it was a really hot box, and they were all undergoing these transitions, we'd be seeing these very thin spikes of emission, right? Yeah. So, because as electrons jump from one to level to another, that's a very well-defined amount of energy. So we'd expect to see a, a, a very sharp feature. But when we see the emission from iron, coming from quasars, mm -hmm. we don't see a sharp feature at all. We actually see a very broad feature, which is actually lopsided, okay? So why is it broad? Well, it's broad because the material is swirling around at high speed. And so the emission from one side is strongly red shifted mm -hmm. and the other side is strongly blue shifted. Right. But when we do our calculations, we have to actually calculate not only the red shift and the blue shift, but also the, the shift that occurs as the photons have to climb out of the gravitational potential. Right. So there's two. So the, the red shift and the blue shift is kind of, is that just a Doppler effect? So if I had two, you know, ambulances going around each other in a circle, you would get the combined effect of both of their, you know, this one's coming towards you in a, playing in a certain key and this one's going away from you. So it's a slightly different key. So you'll get the blend of those. But on top of that, you have another redshift effect from the black hole itself. That's right. Okay. And, but there are also additional effects, right? Now, we've all seen that great science documentary Interstellar, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, and remember, there, there was a big um, hullabaloo about how accurately they had portrayed the, the black hole, right? Mm -hmm. And what they meant by, by that is the, the accretion disk, which they were swirling around the black hole, gets imaged into this sort of strange, almost double donut shape. Mm -hmm. So what we have to remember is when we calculate the, the emission line that we see, 
If you imagine that I, I have a, a black hole and mm -hmm. I've got a flat disk like this, so there'll be some material coming towards you, some material going away, you can calculate the, the Doppler shift. Due to the gravitational lens in effect, i.e. that photons no longer travel in straight lines, I'm actually also receiving signal from light on the other side of the accretion disk. So the combined effect is this really sort of strange distorted shape for the ion emission line. And one of the things that we can do with that distorted shape is, is well, two, there's two key things. One, we can measure the mass of the black hole because the rate that material swirls around is governed by the gravitational pull, which is governed by the mass. Mm -hmm. And also intriguingly, we can calculate the spin of the black hole. Right? right. So one of the things that we haven't mentioned here is these black holes are spinning and they tend to be spinning at a very high rate. But not just the stuff around it, the, the hole itself. The hole itself. So, right. the, so the, 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 the person that first worked out the mathematics of spinning black holes is this um, New Zealand mathematician, Roy Kerr. Roy Kerr. And, and, and we still call them Kerr, Kerr black holes. Mm -hmm. And I believe you and I, you, you were at that talk of his a few years ago in Sydney. I was there. Oh, I don't uh, think I was. No, uh, I missed it. Uh, okay, so he, he spoke about his, he, he did this work while he was at the University of Texas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he came to realize he had written down this equation to describe spinning black holes. But the, the spin of the black hole gets imprinted on the space time around the black hole, which is then imprinted on the motion of material. So by looking at the shape of the iron line, we are able to measure the spin of the, the, these black holes. Which to me is, is kind of astounding, right? That mm. we can we can do this, and we've been able to work out how to relate the distortion in the emission from iron to mm. the mass and the spin of the black hole. Yeah, in terms of getting back to the overall cosmological redshift, these sorts of mechanisms can't explain the overall redshift of a of a quasar. So you know the redshift of a quasar can be as high as seven or eight. I think of the record, it's seven point something. I think, which means that the light, whatever wavelength it started with, it's now you know seven or eight times longer when it arrives at us. But that stretch is totally independent of the wavelength of the light. Mm -hmm. So radio waves are stretched by that amount. Optical light that we see with our eyes, infrared light, you know UV light, these iron lines except for these, these other issues that are all stretched by the same amount. The reason why that would be really hard to do with gravitational um, redshift is because to get the same redshift, you have to sort of depart from the same area of the black hole in the same direction. But all of these different, you know, uh, you know, radio waves and optical light and all that sort of stuff are produced in very different conditions. Uh, and so it would be very unlikely if all the emitting bits around a quasar are all in the same place at the same time, emitting this perfectly, you know, put out their mix of optical and radio and all that sort of stuff. So that as, a, as an explanation of the overall, this factor of five or six or seven or whatever it is, overall cosmological redshift for quasars, that's not going to work. What we're talking about here is then the sort of extra little bits of redshift uh, uh, apart from over and above the average which don't, so that the, the, the amount that the light is stretched isn't just this exact factor of whatever it is, seven or eight or something, but there's also what garain has been talking about this, or you've been talking about this, this extra shape yeah. that, 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 that's the imprint of the black hole itself. I, I'm going to jump back in and mention something about quasars again now, because I, I mean, you and I, we're big fans of quasars, oh, right? Yeah. And one of the things, of course, which uh, when you get the light from a quasar, right, you, you get its spectrum of light. We see that there's like a smooth distribution, right? And that smooth distribution comes from the central accretion disk, the really hot stuff. So there's the iron lines down there, et cetera, and all the hot stuff. But there's also these pronounced emission lines, right? So these are atoms emitting radiation at specific wavelengths. And there's this really nice relationship is that you, you can tell how hot material is by essentially what uh, atoms are emitting light, right, in yeah. that environment. So the hotter the material, things can become more ionized uh, and you get different kinds of transitions. And what we see is that the emission lines can either be broad, which mm -hmm. tells us that stuff is swirling around at high speed, or they can be narrow, which tells us stuff is moving more sedately. And we see that the hot stuff 
is moving around faster because it's closer in. Mm -hmm. And the cool stuff is moving around slower because mm. it's further out. And so it all sort of hangs together, right? This overall picture, this quasar thing is black hole, accretion disk, hot clouds, warm clouds, cool clouds, all going out in a range of, a range of scales. Yeah, it's wonderful stuff. Uh, I should say when you when I started, because I came into astronomy sort of from physics, from a love of physics, that you, you, you want to learn about the universe and suddenly all these astronomers are just talking about like atomic spectrox, spectroscopy all the time and levels in atoms. Why are they talking about all of this stuff and metals and all this sort of stuff? It's because there's so much information in, if you can understand all these lumps and bumps in the, the spectra of light we get, that they're our far and away our most important window on the universe. 